Hello and welcome to Stand in the Gap. Last week on this program in part one, we began a two-part focus on the Tower of Babel. And we learned last week from our special guest, Bodhi Hodge, who is a speaker, writer, and researcher with uh, answers in Genesis. I'm going to say he's also an apologist, which means knowing how to um, explain what you believe effectively. Uh, we went to the book of Genesis. Talks about the Tower of Babel. Uh, we talked about what it was, uh, why it was built, who built it, and why God came down and put a stop to its building. Well, today Isaac Crockett and I will complete our discussion as we examine the three leading reasons why the unbelieving world wishes to reject the biblical account of the Tower of Babel. We'll also establish the relationship between the Tower, biblical authority, and the application to each of us. As Satan did with Eve in the Garden of Eden, he disguised his true ugly and evil person within the trappings of a beautiful creation of God. Disguised as a talking serpent, Satan's first recorded words to Eve were these, Hath God said, and by raising doubt in the trustworthiness of God, the devil did what he does today. He lifted himself above God and planted the seed of pride in the heart of man by enticing man to believe that, well, he himself could become God. And from that moment until now, the devil has continued to plant doubt in the minds of people about the person of God, about creation, about the entire Word of God, and for the focus of today's program, the reality of the Tower of Babel. And as did Satan to Eve in the garden when he planted the seeds of doubt in her mind regarding the truthfulness of God, so has the devil done in regarding to all aspects of God, questions his holiness, his majesty, his sovereignty, refutes the reality and the consequences of sin, disputes God's plan of redemption, and certainly the person and the work of Jesus Christ, the very Son of God. And while the tactics for deception may have changed and the mouthpieces of deception may have changed from serpents to false prophets of all types, what has not changed is the object of the attack, and that is the matter of authority. Whether it be the authority of God Himself, the authority of Jesus Christ, or the authority of the Word of God. So stay with us for part two now of the Tower of Babel. Was it real? And in the end, what difference does it make? And with that, I welcome back again. Bodhi, thank you for being back uh, with uh, Isaac and I today. Hey, it's great to be back. Um, Love being on the show with you. Uh, well, it's always good to be back with you, and it's, and it's so good. Uh, I just want to compliment uh, not just you, but all of those who work with you. Uh, you are with... Um, us on Stand in the Gap Today, a radio program every other month, and one of your cohorts, Brian Osborne, uh, is there with us. And, uh, and our focus on apologetics on those programs, like today, is to help people to understand what the Bible says, and if we say we believe it, why do we believe it, and how can we articulate it? So this Tower of Babel is a great one, uh, because a lot of people say it's not true. Well. Bible says it's true, so we're going to say it's true. But uh, as you did last week, give just a little bit of a summary again why it's important that we start at the beginning in Genesis, why Genesis 1 to 11 is so critical a foundation for the rest of Scripture, and then lead that into the Tower of Babel and the big story behind that. Yeah, well, you know, it's uh, interesting in, in the book of Hebrews. 613, it says that when the Lord swore to Abraham, he swore by himself because there is nothing greater. There is no greater authority than God and his word. And we're in a culture where people attack God and his word, particularly Genesis 1 to 11. And so we're in that culture. What we need to do then is make sure we're standing on Genesis 1 to 11 because that's the true foundation. Even though the culture wants to attack the flood of Noah's day, they want to attack creation, they want to attack the Tower of Babel. We know that we can stand on it because God is the absolute authority. Think of it this way. By what authority can someone object to God's absolute authority? 
The only way they can do that is by appealing to themselves or appealing to other people, or even if they tried to appeal to Satan, that is a lesser authority. That is a faulty appeal to authority fallacy. There is no greater authority than God and his word, so we can trust it, even Genesis 1 to 11. And so when it comes to the Tower of Babel count, that's part of the word of God, we can stand on that firm. Amen. You know, and, and Bodhi, as you even express that, you express that like you really believe it. <laughs> I absolutely do. And, and, and we do, because we know that when we depend on what God says and His authority, we can be confident, because as you said, there is no higher authority. That's not my opinion, and that's not your opinion but it does make a difference that we agree with God that He is the authority. We'll be back in just a moment. Truth, flexible or permanent? The Bible, ancient history or powerfully relevant? Culture, a reflection of enlightenment or warning signs? The pastor, commentator or frontline combatant? Every day, American Pastors Network speaks to these questions where and when they matter. With hundreds of affiliate radio stations nationwide, a website and mobile app screening today's headlines through the twin lenses of the Bible and the Constitution. Educating, informing, equipping. This is the American Pastors Network. The time is now to stand in the gap for truth. Welcome back to Stand in the Gap. The Tower of Babel, uh, was it real? And what is the significance of that? This is a second uh, part um, from last week, a follow-up from last week. Our guest today, Bodie Hodge from Answers in Genesis. And Bodie, we're, we're always glad to have you with us. Um, it's, I think this is... Last week was your first time to be on the television uh, side of things with us. You've been on the radio. Your father-in-law, Ken Ham, some of our folks will recognize him, and some of our, our regular viewers will remember he's the guy with the Australian accent that uh, talks about apologetics and the ARC. And uh, he's been on this pro the, the TV program several times as well as the radio, but you are on with us on a regular basis on the radio program. And uh, you have uh, literally written a book on the Tower of Babel, and your father-in-law uh, has done a lot of... Uh, Writing. Okay, there we go. There's, there's the book. Your father-in-law has done a lot about apologetics and defending Genesis um, from, from Genesis 1 through Tower of Babel and all of that. So we, we want to talk to you about uh, some of the things that you've written. And, and uh, not in a scary way. We're not disagreeing. We're actually, we love what you've written. We're agreeing with it. I was just reading over one of the uh, chapters of your book today uh, and um, uh, getting ready for this. And your book is its actually in the fifth printing right now. It's entitled Tower of Babel, the Cultural History of Our Ancestors. And in it, you identify in the second, the first chapter is all about just even pronouncing the word Babel. We talked about that last week. Um, but you, you identify in uh, chapter two, you say that currently the true history of the Tower of Babel recorded in Genesis 11, one through nine, is attacked in three ways. Um, I found it, found it very interesting, and I, I loved what you were saying. Um, the very first way that it's attacked is an attack that brings about racism, and that word in and of itself needs sometimes some context, but it's something we need to be talking about, and, and it is being talked about. Well, we need to talk about it from a biblical worldview. Could you talk to us and, and explain the, the, what racism has to do with the attack on the historic Babel, Tower of Babel? Yeah. You know, that, that's a great question. I'm actually really glad you asked that. Because, you know, racism is rampant in our culture. In fact, I've been in different parts of the world and I've seen a lot of forms of racism and it's absolutely terrible. And, uh, you know, I look at myself and uh, in all honesty, I'm a mutt. If you know what a mutt is, you know, I've got some German, English, Irish, Portuguese. I've got some Native American, some Italian. I got some uh, Scottish. I got, I got all sorts of stuff in me. And then I marry a lady who's German, English, Irish and Chinese. And, you know, and people sometimes say, well, where did all those people come from? Well, they all go back to Babel. And believe it or not, a lot of people groups we can trace. But in our culture today, people, are, we're, we're conditioned to look at certain things. We're, we're conditioned to look at skin tone, for example, or eyes or hair. There, there's a lot of things that we're, that we're taught to look at, and we shouldn't be looking at it that way. We need to remember we're all related. We all go back to Noah. We all go back to Adam and Eve. We're all sinners in need of Jesus Christ, no matter what we look like. However, 
we're in a culture where people are taught, oh, well, there, there, there's black and there's white and, and so forth. I don't like to use that terminology because we're, we're actually not white and black. I've had people say, Bodie, you're white. No, this is white. <laughs> I don't look like that. If I look like that, call a hearse. It's over with. Um, in fact, I'm kind of brownish. In fact, we're all kind of brown. Some are more brown, some are less brown. And what it is, it's a, a pigment in our skin uh, called melanin. It's a brownish pigment. If we produce more of it, we're darker in skin tone. If we produce less of it, we're lighter in skin tone. So we're all kind of brown. Uh, you know, there's uh, little kids uh, around the world that sing that song, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. There's kids now singing that differently. They're singing it, shades of brown from dark to light, they are precious in his sight. And that's technically more accurate. But, you know, we've been conditioned to look at people that way. And what we need to do is step back, start with the Bible, let God be God. There's one race, the human race. We have variation in that, and that is a beautiful thing. But stop looking at it as though there's higher and lower races. That actually comes out of a Darwinian evolutionary worldview. And we need to be careful, especially as Christians, of buying into that worldview and bringing those tenets over to a Christian worldview. Uh, Bodie, let me follow up with this uh, with you, if you don't mind, with what Isaac just asked you. Because in the book, you state that the first attack of racism is, a, is an attack to dispute the record of the Tower of Babel. I, I don't know, maybe I wasn't listening to what you said, but how is racism used to dispute the reality of the Tower of Babel? Well, the Tower of Babel explains why people look so different. You see, the genetic pool from all of those different families they're listed in Genesis chapter 10, they split apart. For example, let me put it like this. Let's say my wife and I go to a remote island somewhere, and all of a sudden we start having kids and kids, and they start intermarrying with each other, and they start having kids. All those kids, the gene pool that they're going to pick from is from me and my wife. They're not going to look like you. They're not going to look like anyone else. They're kind of going to have the, the, the genetic uh, variability within my wife and I. So that's kind of what happened at the Tower of Babel. People who went to uh, Asia, for example, took genes for uh, almond-shaped eye. People who went to Africa took genes for darker skin. People who went to Scandinavia took genes for lighter skin. That gene pool was split apart. But we're in a culture that has said, oh, well, the Tower of Babel is a myth. That didn't really happen. So they're trying to explain why do people look a little different around the world. And what they've done is they bought onto a Darwinian worldview that says you evolved out of Africa from ape-like creatures. And so you get some that are more evolved, less evolved, and so forth. And all of a sudden, they start calling those different races, and then you start to see the conflicts. And so you have to be very careful about those types of things that are occurring in our culture. And as Christians, we need to be able to fight against that. Okay, I think that's excellent, uh, Bodhi. And I just wanted to clarify that, that, that people who do not believe in the Tower of Babel are not saying those who do are racist. What right. you're saying is that those who don't believe in the Tower of Babel don't want to give God credit for His action at the Tower of Babel, and that God's dispersing people around the world created the distinctions. They want to go back and explain the distinctions as arising out of the mud in Darwinian evolution. Correct. Right, okay. And that's what it is. It's a worldview battle. It's an authority battle because are we going to trust man like Darwin or are we going to trust what God has to say? So it comes back to that authority of Scripture issue. Okay, there you go. That wanted to make that clear so folks could understand that because it's a big difference. And again, it's all back to the authority of what God said in God's Word. So let's go to the second. Uh, in the book, you identified uh, an area, the second attack. Uh, you define as uh, mythology. And um, I suppose that is saying that people say, well, it's just a myth. It's Alice in Wonderland, make-believe. Uh, build that out a little bit. What do they say? And then I'd like you to resolve that from an apologetic perspective. How do you answer the critics who wish to dispute the reality of the Tower of Babel by saying it's only a myth? Right. Well, you know, I kind of mentioned this on the last program. Uh, you know, if you type in Tower of Babel, uh, Wikipedia, for example, or Encyclopedia Britannica, or, or, or plenty of other sites. I read a technical paper recently. The very first line of it was the Tower of Babel is a myth. And then they go through looking at the archaeology of the Tower of Babel, which is kind of interesting. Uh, and yet what, what's happening, though, are people are automatically throwing the Bible out. They're just saying, get rid of it. Genesis 1 to 11, you can't trust it. That includes Tower of Babel, throw it out. So therefore, man's ideas are elevated to supersede God. And uh, when, when people do that, 
What, what they real, they may not realize this, that's a faulty appeal to authority fallacy. God says it happened, it did happen, we have archaeological evidence for it. Uh, one of my favorites is the Tower of Babel Stele. It is a, a, it's a rock, <laughs> it's not made out of steel, but it's actually got an engraving of the Tower of Babel with Nebuchadnezzar standing in front of this uh, old tower. Now this was a rebuild of it, but it was the same site and so forth. So, I mean, we see really good pieces of evidence of this, it's a good confirmation of it, but because the Bible has it, that's why it's true. So it is. It goes back to that issue of authority once again. And it's so neat when we find these uh, historic, um, you know, things that have been archived in, sometimes in the ground, and they're uncovered. That doesn't prove the Bible. We already know and believe the Bible, but it's just more evidences pointing those who are willing to, to look at it. So you've talked about these uh, three attacks. Um, one is that uh, people don't believe that God intervened to disperse the nations or, or to, to the people, which led to the people groups of today. And so that that uh, unfortunately has led to a racism, and which is not really scientific and it's not biblical. Um, and then the other is that they try to say, oh, it's just, you know, mythological, it's not real, and there's historic evidence, and it, it is real because God said it. Uh, but the last thing, you talk about trying to reinterpret the, the history, the narrative that we find in Genesis, and it gets reinterpreted. Could you kind of discuss that for us? Yeah, we're seeing this even within churches, uh, even sometimes, you know, a lot of a lot of people who hold to Judaism, they absolutely love the Old Testament, but sometimes it gets reinterpreted. So, you know, we're seeing that in churches, we're seeing it in different places where people are like, well, I'm not sure I can trust it, but I don't want to just throw it out. So how about I just reinterpret it to mean something different? And so we're seeing different narratives of people popping up saying, well, maybe the tower didn't mean tower, maybe the, the mud didn't mean the mud, the brick didn't mean the brick, the asphalt didn't mean the asphalt. And they're using that as metaphors to mean something different. What we need to do is step back, read it in context, just read it plainly, it makes sense. Uh, other places in scripture look back to it and, and viewed it as a real event, whether it's uh, creation, whether it's the flood, whether it's the Tower of Babel. So we should be reading the scripture the way it's meant to be read. And it was a real event uh, that actually did split things up. What I like to look at though too, is the amazing confirmations that we read of a lot of those names. When you, I don't know if you're ever in a Bible study and you're, you're reading around in a circle and you see what's ahead. You see all these genealogies of these names and you're like, oh Lord, please don't let me be the one that has to read those. Uh, and of course it does. Well, Genesis 10 is like that. There's all these names, and sometimes people just kind of gloss over those names. They don't realize who those names are. Those names are found all over the world, all over. It, it's absolutely fascinating, sometimes variations of those names. Let me just give you a handful of examples just to tease you, because I have a whole chapter in here that discusses these people and where they went. But one of Noah's great-grandsons, his name was Ashkenaz. You might think, okay, can pronounce it. I'm impressed. <laughs> Ashkenaz is actually the ancient name for Germany. Uh, Ashkenaz originally by history settled north of the Black Sea, then he moved up into Central Europe, and we see a reflection of his name in Scandinavia or a Saxon, the Saxons, think Angles and Saxons. Those are actually variations of his name. A lot of the Jews that fled from Rome in AD 70 went up to Germania. Uh, the reason they went up there is Rome didn't control it. That was a place that they could escape to. They became known as the Ashkenazi Jews. We still use that name today. A lot of the Jews that have went back down to their homeland uh, are called Ashkenazi Jews. So you still see a reflection of that name. Sometimes we don't realize that's the name. So we do see those types of examples. You know, the land of Canaan. Canaan is one of Noah's grandsons. He was at the Tower of Babel. Uh, most people in a Bible study kind of can immediately point out where the land of Canaan was. Uh, Egypt. Every time we see Egypt in the Old Testament, the Hebrew behind it is Mitzrium. Uh, it looks like Mizrium, but it's Mitzrium. That's one of Noah's grandsons. That is the Hebrew name for Egypt. We use the Greek name Egyptus uh, when we use it in our Bible, so we translate it that way. Javan is the Hebrew name for Greece. That's one of Noah's grandsons. We see these names all over the world, and it's just fascinating when you start to study that. Uh, the Bible is true by virtue of it coming from God, who is the ultimate truth. But when we see these different aspects and elements, it's a wonderful confirmation. And uh, it's, it really helps strengthen my faith, just knowing that I'm a mutt and I can see some of that ancestry going back to the Tower of Babel. So, Bodhi, what you're saying here, um, and we have like 60 seconds for you to answer, and I know you could talk hours about this, but you're, you're going, taking us full circle back to where Sam started with authority. God's authority, 
um, and the, the Word of God, Scripture, the authority of Scripture. Uh, why is all this important? Why would you connect authority of Scripture with the authority of, of believing in this uh, uh, Tower of Babel? Well, it all comes back to God and His Word. There is no greater authority than God. If that's one thing get, somebody gets out of this program, there is no greater authority than God, whether it's Genesis 1-1, whether it's the last verse of Revelation, whether it's the book of Matthew, whether it's Isaiah, God is always right. And that's what we can rest assured. And we as fallible, sinful human beings, we fall short all the time. But you know what? The Lord revealed to us the truth, and it's time for us to start standing on it. If there's somebody out there that's watching this that's struggled with these issues, I want to encourage you step back, go back to the Bible, uh, repent of your ways, and stand on the authority of God and His Word. It will change your life. Amen. Amen. Stand on the authority of Scripture, as our program is entitled, Stand in the Gap, uh, and that's taking a stand for truth. We're going to be right back just after this. Stand in the Gap is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV. Positively different. Okay, Bodie, we're going to wrap up the program right now. And I said at the beginning of the program, I thought actually maybe it may have been last week as well. In this title, I've said the Tower of Babel. Was it real? And then the question, what difference does it make? I want you to make this relevant right now. We've talked about on this program highlighting the importance of the authority of what God says, who He is, what He's written in His Word. And talked to you earlier, you talk confidently, Bodhi. Well, I talk confidently, I do, and so does Isaac, and so does everyone who believes in what God's Word says. It gives us confidence. So let's wrap it up here now in this context, however God would lead you to go. What difference does it make on what a person thinks or does not think? about the Tower of Babel. Well, that's exactly right, right there where you're talking about it. It is a battle for the mind. And you know, we're in a culture where we've been led down an entirely different path, an entirely different religion. In the Western world, we have been taught an evolutionary worldview that we came ultimately from nothing, that came from a Big Bang, that ultimately came from nothing, and in 78 trillion years, nothing's ultimately going to matter. But you know what? When you start with God and His Word, we have value because we are made in the image of God, every single one of us. And even though we've sinned and we've all fallen short, it's only one step back to God. It's only one step back to His authority and His Word. And you know what? The Tower of Babel relates to this. We've seen people attacking it in a multitude of ways, and yet God is always right. And what I want to encourage people to do is get back to God and His Word. Guess what? Genesis 1 to 11, it's true, but so is the rest of the Bible, which means the passages about Jesus Christ and His death, burial, and resurrection are also true. You see, there's a connection between that. That all comes from God and His Word. There is no greater authority than God. And you know what? When you trust in Jesus Christ, believe in death, burial, and resurrection, and you stand in the blood of Jesus Christ, it's powerful. It is powerful. It is, uh, Bodhi, it is powerful indeed, and that's exactly why God has put us here, to give glory to Him for what He has done, and that's what the Scripture is all about. Bodhi, thank you so much for your ministry and for being with us uh, today on the program. God bless you, brother. And ladies and gentlemen, as we wrap it up, uh, Bodhi's talking about the fact that we need a return to God. That's what we are offering in this booklet, which is now available. I want you to go to our website, standinthegapradio.com, or actually AmericanPastorsNetwork.net. Either one will take you there. And we've put together a booklet, 11 Principles for National Renewal. It's all in the context of return to God. And what is in that book, designed for your personal study, or for use in a small group, or your Sunday school, or actually for a series of sermons from the pulpit, is what the Bible says. It's God's plan for an orderly society. 
We understand who God is. We understand the nature of man, the purpose for law, the purpose for government, the purpose for justice. It's what our founders actually adopted in this country because it comes right off the pages of Scripture and it always works. In a return to God, we need to repent, go, confess our sins before Him, but then we need to change the way we think. And uh, these, this journey guide that is before, I encourage you to go there, will help you to establish that biblical foundation, which in reality is the restoration of a biblical world view. It makes all the difference in how we view the world and what's around us. Thanks for watching today. God bless you, and we'll see you back here next week, the Lord willing.